show, Congressman. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I want to ask you about this, which must have been a trippy night for you when you won election. Um, it was 2016. That was election night. It was. So, uh, a big night for you, and yet a weird night overall. Well, I had lost two elections before then, and as my brother says, 2016 was the year anyone could get elected. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very, uh, very nice way so of, I made it. <laughs> of a brother for a brother to say it. Uh, uh, before, uh, I want to move on to some other stuff, but I, I have to ask, like, what has it been like uh, for you this week uh, with the impeachment hearings? Has it changed your take on any of it? And are you uh, surprised, or is it what you expected, that it doesn't seem like it's changed any Republican minds? Well, that it hasn't, but this is not complicated. I mean, you can sum up the whole thing in one sentence. Donald Trump pressured the Ukraine president to dig up dirt on Joe Biden and withheld aid. And you got hours and hours and hours of testimony, but there's no factual dispute. I mean, we ought to vote to impeach. There you go. That was very simple. <laughs> and, and you know, the Republicans, they don't have a factual defense. So they basically say, okay, let's just uh, attack the witnesses. It's like if your team is losing down 20 points, you just attack the refs. I mean, that's basically their strategy. You, uh, you know, I think watching congressional hearings is uh, always remarkable because, you know, you see people elected from across the country, and uh, some of them are good at talking to witnesses, some of them are not good at talking to witnesses. Right. You represent Silicon Valley, and I think one thing that is always uh, notable to me is how often uh, when uh, Congress people are interviewing tech leaders, they don't seem to understand how even the Internet works. <laughs> Well, the technology hearings haven't been one of the finer moments in Congress. And yeah. there are a lot of embarrassing moments. But, uh, you know, when you have senators asking, how does Facebook make money? Or you had one member of Congress, he literally, he held up his iPhone and he starts yelling at Google CEO saying, can you track me if I move five feet? And the Google CEO is perplexed and says, well, it's Apple that makes the iPhone. <laughs> So, you know, this doesn't exactly inspire confidence, uh, yeah. given that we're the body that has to regulate technology. You are, uh, again, you represent uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, you're also a co-chair of Bernie Sanders' campaign. I am. So, uh, obviously, that's a very progressive wing of the party. You don't believe in this idea of breaking up big tech, but you do think it requires a reform? Is that the right word to use? Absolutely. I mean, here's the deal. We're going through a technology revolution in this country. Everyone uses Google. Everyone gets packages in Amazon. But there's been a concentration of wealth and jobs and economic opportunity in Silicon Valley. The challenge, I really believe, of our time is how do we extend the technology revolution to rural America, to minority communities, to places left out? No one should have to leave their hometown just to get a job of the 21st century. Well, this is an interesting situation for you because I think it's very rare for someone who re represents the district basically saying not that you want to, you know, collect the power, but you're basically admitting there is too much power right now in your district. There's too much a concentration of economic activity, and I'm probably the only congressman where people are saying, look, there's too much traffic, the cost of housing is too much. You know the average job at a software company is 15 months? I mean, how long have you been doing this? I imagine more than 15 months. Yeah, a lot longer so, than 15 months. So think about it. People want to work, if you want to work five, six, seven years somewhere, a Silicon Valley company should go elsewhere as well to recruit. And it's a win-win. It's a win for my district, and it'll be a win for the country. Look, Donald Trump went around the country, and he basically said, I'm going to bring your old jobs back. Right. And the past is better than the future. We've got to convince people that technology is going to bring new jobs, more opportunity for their kids, and that the future is better and something that they're going to uh, have an access to in the American dream. There are obviously a lot of elected officials because we have such a, uh, there is such a, a big field of Democratic candidates who haven't jumped in yet. You jumped in early as a co-chair for Bernie's uh, uh, campaign. What is it, what can you tell us about Bernie that we might not know from seeing him uh, in public? He's got a great sense of humor. Yeah. And I'll tell you one uh, quick anecdote. he seems very gruff. He's, there's times where he maybe doesn't seem like he has a great he's, sense. I mean, he's not quite your sense of humor, but he's got a, well, he's got a, <laughs> I mean, you know, no, <laughs> but, but, but he's got a dry sense of humor. I'll tell you, you know, when he was hospitalized, uh, I was going to be speaking in Iowa for him. And so I asked the staff, what should I tell people? And they said, well, you tell them that uh, he had a myocardial infraction. So, so instead of heart attack. Myocardial some... infraction. And so I'm Googling this, what, what is a myocardial infraction? And then I get a call from Bernie Sanders. I said, Senator, how are you doing? He says, oh, I'm doing great. 
He said, Roe, I don't recommend, though, that you ever get a heart attack. <laughs> so I said, all right, we're going with heart attack. <laughs> yeah. And I'm glad you did. I think uh, for the straight talk of somebody like Bernie Sanders, that's better than myocardial he, fracture. He's blunt. Uh, he's honest. Uh, but the main reason I'm backing him is his platform is simple. He wants everyone to have health care. He wants everyone to have free education. You know, one of the worst attacks when people say, oh, giving Medicare for all is elitist. Have you heard this? Yeah. I mean, the idea when 66 percent of Americans want Medicare for all. And, it, and if you're saying, look, you're going to get health care, you don't have to pay co-pays. You don't have to pay premiums. You don't have to pay deductibles. There are a lot of criticisms you can make. Elitist isn't one of them. Yeah. Well, uh, best of luck uh, with everything going forward. Thank you so much for making the time Thank you. for us tonight. Representative Rokana, everybody.